so that we can upload this to YouTube. So welcome to the people that are watching on YouTube as well. Um, so I thought I would start with uh, a quick introduction. Let me just resize this a little bit. Um, since this is my first stream on Twitch, so I'm hoping I can save this on Twitch for later, maybe break it into two different parts. First, my introduction, just so that people know my background in photography a little bit, and then we'll get into the photo series of skateboarders. So I'm thinking of calling this a film photography series review. So um, let me just talk a little bit about myself and how I got started in photography. I've been into photography since around 2007 when the iPhone came out, uh, usually just shot on my mobile phone. Um, and while I had a digital camera at that time, uh, didn't use it much, um, used it on vacations or what have you, because obviously at that time before we had a decent camera in our phone, um, you brought a camera with you and you used what you had and, and that was about it. So I took photos on vacations and things, but not much else, you know, didn't really think about composition and lighting and why I was even shooting the photo or anything like that. So 2007 came around, you get a phone in your pocket, start shooting some uh, photos all the time of your eggs in the morning to anything that goes on in your life. So it becomes like a documentation of your life over time. Uh, and then, you know, social networks start coming out on the phone that allow you to look at other people's photography. And I think that influenced me a lot to start thinking about composition and rules of thirds and uh, just caring about lighting and not using filters on Instagram because they were terrible and all of that. So um, fast forward a few years and I started to really just say, hey, I really want to start taking this a little bit more seriously. And uh, so uh, with the DSLR that I've had, the one that you see in this photo uh, that Eliza and I had for, I mean, we've had this camera for 18 years maybe or something. I mean, we've had, I still have it. I still use it all the time. Um, you know, did some landscape photography um, on my hikes. This is in Iceland. Uh, vacations. Just started thinking more, and this is with a drone, but just started thinking more about taking cool images, you know, taking images that I enjoyed looking at um, and paying more attention, I guess you could say, to why am I shooting a photograph. Uh, yeah, I want to look at it later and remember where I've been, but then can I make something that maybe I would want to put on my wall or whatever. And I also like to shoot wild wildlife uh, digitally. So, um, you know, going out on hikes and trying to get close to things using a long lens. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, I think a lot of times I watch YouTubers on <laughs> and I see so many landscape photographers that are really, in my opinion, just people that love to hike, love nature and love to capture cool, capture cool images while they're out there. You know, rather than putting that, that title on top of yourself of being a photographer, it's just about enjoying your surroundings. And I think a lot of people fall into that category, and sometimes I do too. Um, then started thinking more about, you know, doing more abstract things or just um, more artsy things and that don't really have a purpose uh, necessarily other than trying to capture a look or a feel. Uh, but then Right at the end of 2019, in, in December of 2019, um, I was photographing some uh, an area near my home and I was using the digital camera and I had seen so many people that were shooting on film and something drew me to the process. I don't know why. Uh, I think digital is very quick. Uh, it can be. doesn't mean that there's not great photographers that take their time digitally, but it's so quick that there isn't as much thought put to each photo that you take. And I've been living in the digital world since I was a kid, and I never had exposure to film other than when I was very young. And so I just was kind of really uh, interested in it, and I saw the results that some of my friends were getting, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if 
if I could switch to digital and maybe slow myself down. And so in December of 2019, I bought a $5 point and shoot camera. But I decided that I wanted to learn everything. I decided I would never send a uh, film canister in to be processed by someone else. Um, unless I really want to print something big, I will probably never send anything out to be printed by someone else. I really want to be able to learn how to do everything on my own. And so I just immersed myself less so in the photography part of it for the first few years. Almost, I mean, it wasn't until just recently that I think I'm starting to get results that I appreciate. So I was more worried about how does this thing work? How do the chemicals work? You know, uh, I bought a ton of cameras, cameras upon cameras upon cameras, um, cheap thrift stores, uh, just yard sales, trying to find something that I, I really liked um, and even built some of my own cameras. Here's a box camera that I literally made out of a Cheez-It box uh, just to understand how does the camera work? Well, how does the lens, what, what difference does the lens make? Uh, what is what difference does it make as far as every part of the camera the aperture to where the focal plane is to the medium that you expose whether it's paper or film I even made a camera out of our bedroom uh, and you can find a YouTube video I uploaded a YouTube video describing this process uh, during quarantine fun quarantine project to turn your entire room into a camera um, so definitely look that up on YouTube but Eventually I settled on these two cameras, which will probably be my cameras that I'd like to have for the rest of my life. Um, the Canon AE-1, which was gifted to me by my brother-in-law, uh, John. Thank you, John. Um, and the Mamiya 645 Pro. Uh, if you have any questions about these cameras, drop them in the comments or in the uh, chat or email me or something, and I can tell you why I chose these. Uh, I these are the cameras that I want to have for the rest of my life um, and I want to keep them in good condition and be able to just learn these two camera systems um, I am looking for a new digital camera so I'm not opposed to digital at this point uh, but these are the film cameras that I think I'm going to use forever so when it came to processing the film I was processing the film in our apartment's sink at the time uh, warming here I am warming up chemicals to be a specific temperature for uh, processing color imagery uh, making contact prints and uh, developing film in the tub and my results in the beginning again this is just part of my intro before we get to my my photos so I can kinda explain the context of these photos but the results weren't that great when I first started obviously you can see here I did a lot of things wrong um, I was using expired uh, film from a friend of mine that had it frozen since 1982, Joe, thank you. And uh, you can see the results here. This is cool looking in an abstract artistic fine art way, um, but it wasn't obviously what I would want. I, I want to, I, my goal was to be able to make perfect photos and then back up from there, add my style, add my, my own, uh, opinion to what the photo should end up like, but I had to start at being able to get to what is considered a well-exposed, properly developed film. And for those of you that are watching this that don't know how that even happens, essentially um, a 30-second version of how film works is that when you expose it to light by clicking the shutter, there are elements in the film that chemically change because photons hit it because light hits the film and then you exaggerate that change by using chemicals so you can imagine if you were to lightly draw on a piece of paper with uh, a pencil and then go back over it with marker later so when you expose your film, you're just using some pencil and you're telling the film where the light fell. And then with chemicals, you go in and you change that uh, chemistry on the film to be permanent and to uh, exaggerate. 
I believe it's like five million times or one million times or something like that. You exaggerate the change. Uh, and so when it's black and white film, you know, uh, you're just kind of telling it where did light fall and at what degree. You know, there's certain contrasts and things, but, you know, technically speaking, there's only so much tonal range to a piece of film. So you're just kind of saying where did the really bright light fall and where did no light fall? That's the difference between white and black and everything in between. So then when you uh, process it, you're just exaggerating that. And so eventually, uh, I got to where I was... Now this, if you notice, this is the same film between the same expired, expired 1982 film and one of them, the results are not so good. Uh, I, I, I probably remember what I did wrong here. I think I rolled the film onto the film spool incorrectly and so the chemical did not properly touch the surface of all the film and so you end up with something that's I think very cool looking anyway that, with this but then this was one of my first successful shots which I uh, really like I've printed this a few times in the dark room uh, I got to where I was able to do color and color is uh, you know you'll you'll hear a lot from people that say you do color or you might not hear this a lot but you there are many that would be scared to do film at uh, color film at home don't be scared. Getting uh, chemical, getting your chemical to 102 degrees, isn't that hard anymore. Um, not only can you just use your tap water because your tap water uh, usually comes out hot enough to warm up the chemicals to that temperature, and you just get yourself a thermometer and try to keep it about there between 102 and 104, let's say, and you'll get. I get decent results. Um, there are other ways to, to control that temperature even more with, with other equipment and stuff, but by and large, you can do it even just in your sink. Then I started to, my goal is to become a, a portrait photographer that takes environmental portraits of people. Um, and so I started working up the courage of saying, can I photograph you? And this is a friend of mine, Carl, who was painting one day, uh, and I went with him and I was able to photograph him. Um, and, you know, I was able to walk up to a stranger on the street near my work. And then you have people that you see just out and about when you're enjoying yourself. So I started to, to work up the nerve of starting to photograph people. That is my goal. Um, I still want to be able to be good at wildlife, but I probably won't do that on film. Uh, much, if at all, because digital is just better suited for taking wildlife photography. Um, you need a lot of shots to get a good picture of a bird more often than not and it is not worth the price of film to try to do that uh, so people captured on film film lasts forever not only is a digital file kind of ephemeral you know my computer is going to change and all these different things but I'll always have my negatives hopefully and if I print them in my darkroom which we'll get into very briefly um, some of those prints that I make uh, technically and chemically speaking can last uh, a thousand years they say or something so because it literally turns into silver so um, that's kind of my goal is to make really meaningful portraits of interesting people whether they just be my family members which I've done or friends of mine or artists I really am into art and things so I really like to capture an artist in their studio and things which I'll show you this next one this is probably my first real attempt at a sit-down portrait. Uh, someone that knew I was going to take their photo, and it was very much on purpose. This is Bill Ciccolo. Um, he lives not too far from, uh, or his studio, rather, is not too far from where we live. And so I called him, or one day, I think, um, I just emailed him out of the blue, and maybe a month later he called me. I said, I am learning film photography. I'd like to come... Uh, interview you for my website which I have a website called the watercolor gallery um, and I did an interview with him and he was very gracious sat down for a photo I had no idea what I'm doing um, I'm leaving these crops in here for you photographers that might be listening to this later I should have been tighter here uh, or wider which is very interesting the, his studio was a mess of paint if you look at the wall on his, uh, on the left side of the image, 
that wall and the floor was just oil paint everywhere and I wish I captured more of that and I didn't. But if I were to get tighter on him, uh, which I discussed recently with a streamer on Twitch, this is Kyle, thank you very much Kyle for helping me with that, um, learning just a little bit more on, on how to properly crop these. But I'm leaving these original crops here to show I'm still learning. I have a long way to go. Most of the photographers that I look up to in environmental portraiture have been doing it for decades. So I have no illusions of being very good at this for a very long time. It's not so much about the capturing of the image as it is about the entire process. Um, you know, you get nervous. When I was in this situation, I thought three minutes felt like four hours. And I felt like I was taking up his time. And in reality, if I asserted myself and I had confidence, I would have sat with him and said, we're taking three hours on this and that's how long it's gonna take. And I'm gonna bring lights in here and whatever. Uh, I'm going to stage the photo slightly, you know, maybe move him into an area that I could have gotten more of the environment. Um, and I just need to be confident. I need to learn those things. I need to be, you know, have more experience and I don't have much experience. Here's another uh, photo I did recently um, on a train, which is really, really fun to do. And so I'm still learning. Uh, those are some of that, that's my goal, is to get into an, uh, environmental portraiture. And so thank you for letting me take a few, the first almost 20 minutes of introducing myself. So I'm gonna cut this and make this be a separate video, but. Um, so you might be asking like, why do this on Twitch? Um, I even as much as last night was like really debating whether I should do this or not. Um, I almost didn't. Uh, I was just gonna upload a video to YouTube like I've done before. Uh, but I do think that this is a very good way and perhaps right now as it stands, the best way of showing photos online. Um, Instagram is terrible to show photos. Um, we have amazing cameras that take large, color dense, beautiful imagery, and yet we show them on the smallest screen possible. And while the screens that we have in our hand are amazing screens, uh, they just aren't large enough, really. It comes down to it, I hope that you're watching this stream on something larger than a phone. Um, and if you're not, I hope that you go to YouTube video after this is over, you know, I think I can upload it tonight. Um, that you take some time to look at some of these photos on a large screen. Maybe not my photos, but any photos that you end up seeing online, I hope you take the time. If you see a great photo on Instagram, Go to the profile of the photographer, find their website, and then view it on your the largest screen you have. Uh, I, I really uh, recommend that. Um, so the other thing, the other reason to stream my content is because I want to create some content that I would like to watch. And there is a lot of you. There's a lot of great film content out there. There's a lot of great photography content out there. Uh, but there's a lot of just gear reviews and pitting this film against that film and this camera against that camera. And those things are valuable when you're when you're going to go buy a camera or something. Like, it's really nice to see, like, oh, well, how does this camera compare to that camera? There's no doubt that those there's a place in the world for all of those types of things. But I wanted to bring something substantive to film photography online, my stuff. Uh, and I can say I have some inspiration. Um, so here are some of the, you know, people and companies and museums that lately have been super intriguing to me. Um, the Louisiana Channel lately, I've been looking at them. 45 minutes just talking to one photographer about a couple of their photos. Really nice. Alex Soth uh, is doing reviews of the books in his library. He himself is a, is a accomplished photographer, but he's reviewing other people's work uh, in a really nice, well-produced way to look at photos, look at how they were created and how they might be important. 
um, to look at photo books and the series and how they're placed together and his general commentary on it being that he is uh, very educated in the medium. Um, if you want to up your IQ on art and photography, some of these people are, are great. Kim Beal, I just found recently, has a YouTube channel that is going through books as well. Um, the London Alternative Photography Collective, people that are making photos with very alternative means. So alternative meaning not just film and not digital. So they're capturing the insides of fish and <laughs> um, I don't know, using different chemical processes, using just alternative things that aren't, aren't mainstream and giving them a voice, giving them an hour to talk about their work and the stuff that they do with it. Uh, Nick Carver, um, doing great work on YouTube, but he himself is a very good photographer. And Ilford Photo has some great stuff on the photographers themselves. So all of these people, um, these are my inspiration. This is the kind of style that I want to try to follow with my streams. Um, boring for many, uh, but if you dig this stuff as much as many of you, many, many that I see out there that do, uh, not boring at all, fascinating and well worth the time. And I hope that my content is even, you know, 1% as interesting as theirs. Um, so here's some thanks to some people that are helping me just to stream. Uh, well, not even just to stream, but in photography itself. Nick Carver answered every question I sent him. Dan Rubin's been a friend of mine since 2003 or something. He's super popular on Instagram because I think he was one of the first users on there. But he's a down-to-earth kind of person and is always willing to help out photographers. Um, and he kind of pushed me over the edge with film, helped me to understand what I wanted for my first camera, my first film camera. Um, and yeah, I, I just, you know, the Twitch streamers that you see that are listed there, not only did they encourage me to do this, but also helped me by saying, get some followers. You know, Steve Carty shout outed to me and other people just encouraged me to do it. I asked them a bunch of questions. They answered every question. And then I have some friends listed there that answer my questions all the time or, and put up with me sending them, you know, iMessages all the time of my photos and stuff. Okay, so... I want to get into this photo series. Um, I shot this in 2021. Uh, I don't remember what month it was. I'm sorry. Um, it was the same day that we had a yard sale. I remember that. Uh, I had gone to the skate park early in the day. It was very hot. I should have known no one would be there. Um, it's kind of like going to a basketball court at noon. You know no one's going to be there. It's way too hot out. So it must have been midsummer or late summer maybe. And uh, I went later in the day and was able to find more find more people there that were skating. So I hope you enjoy some of these, these photos. But when I go through these photos, um, I learned a lot on this shoot. I did not do a very good job on this shoot at all, but I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I learned a lot. And I think I learned at least three really good main lessons from the skateboarders themselves that I can apply to photography. So I've taken the time to kind of put those in this presentation so that other photographers can learn from other communities. Obviously we find inspiration outside of the photographic community. We find inspiration from painters, from musicians, from the, the world of movies. Uh, and so why not from skateboarders? So let's get into it. Um, here is the negatives on a light table. Most of these photos that you'll see were 35 millimeter. Uh, I did have my medium format camera with me uh, and only shot maybe one or two frames and I did a terrible job with them. I don't, no, I, I shouldn't say that medium format's not suited for shooting uh, skateboarders, but I do think that light and fast wins the day when it comes to shooting uh, uh, skateboarders or any sport probably. So when I went to the skate park at midday, I ran into this guy, Josh. Um, he is not much younger than me, like just a little bit younger than me. I'm 41. And he said that he had kind of hung up the skateboard many years ago and 
during the pandemic wanted to lose some weight and so he was back at it um, uh, I really appreciated that he let me take his photo because he said I hate photos of me but sure go ahead and take a photo <laughs> so he was very nice and he was also very nice to my nephew Gavin who was there and let him use a skateboard and uh, was definitely a, a good dude and um, this photo I, I don't know if I'm going to critique my own photos maybe I'll critique this one it's midday it's super super bright and I put the sun at his back couldn't have done worse I still like the photo I don't care. I might crop it a lot tighter later on or whatever, uh, get rid of maybe the left-hand side of the entire image or something, but this was shot on medium format, actually, so I can probably zoom way in, but uh, again, these are almost all uncropped, I think. Maybe straightened a little bit or whatever, but a lot of times I don't straighten the, the, the skateboarder photos because, um, you know, the they're, they're in motion and stuff, so you don't want to do that. But uh, I still like this photograph. I mean, I just like the story of him, and I, I'll remember it forever. Um, I do remember that when he was trying to do a slide on this, uh, or grind, I apologize to every skateboarder that might watch this, uh, whatever the terminology is, man. I, I'm not a skateboarder myself. I envy you. I wish I was. I wish I started when I was like eight or something. Um, he tried over and over and over and over and over to nail this. Uh, and I think he was worried about me capturing an image of him not landing it. I told him, <laughs> I said, when you take a photo and you're stopping time while you're doing your trick, there's no way of knowing whether or not you landed the photo, or excuse me, landed the trick in the photo. And he said, I would know. There's probably a lesson to be pulled from that as well. Um, that's like a painting the back of the fence type lesson right there. Uh, so this brings me to lesson one that I personally learned from uh, skateboarders, which is try, 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 try. Um, you know, these guys attempt a single trick countless times. Over and over and over and over. Bam, knee. Bam, wrists. Falling on the ground. Sweating. I mean, perseverance with skateboarding is, if you don't, if you're not someone that is going to try a lot of times, you are not going to cut it. And I think in photography, there is imposter syndrome like crazy in photography. Uh, I have it for sure. Every photo that I take, develop, look at, put all my effort into, I think every one of them is terrible on one day. And then the next day, I think, man, I did a pretty good job with that one. And then the next day, the same photo, I hate it. Uh, and I'm comparing myself a lot of times to what other people have done. And so, I do think there's something to be said for taking 10,000 photos and hoping that you get three of them. I do think there's, there's something in that. So this lesson does apply to take, 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 take tons of photos. But I also think that you don't need to take 10,000. You can, you can kind of increase your hit ratio uh, by slowing down, doing things on purpose, um, taking your time, being meaningful, being observant. Uh, I do think that, that there, you, can, you can increase your hit ratio. I think that if you're buying a camera based on the number of frames it can shoot per second, you might be leading yourself down a path of having a bunch of junk. But if you're buying a camera that gives you the results that you want, but it might be a little bit slower, that might end up being to your advantage. Anthony I met um, later in the evening, and he was super gracious to me. So if you're watching Anthony, uh, which you might be because I think you saw my Instagram story and you saw the fact that I used your photo as uh, my way of saying, hey, guys, come watch this. Um, thank you, Anthony, because 
when I asked Anthony if I could take his photograph, he was totally cool with it. I also saw him on the news because uh, I did a couple of Google searches on his name and found out that, you know, when the, when the skate park was covered on the news and stuff, he was obviously there for that and things, so he obviously doesn't mind his um, image being out there, and I think he likes to promote the sport, I think he likes to promote the park. He seems like an all-around great dude. He really pushes it, too. Um, there is no doubt that Anthony goes for it. Um, I mean, I don't know his personal skill level. I don't know one, you know, I can't really tell one skateboarder from another whether or not they're really good or not. I mean, some people it seems kind of obvious whether they're either terrible or pretty good. Um, so I don't know what his skill level was that day that I was there. Um, but I could tell he was really putting in effort because uh, he failed a lot. Um, and he was really, really giving it a lot of effort, too. You, you just tell on his face and everything. Um, I think some of these shots... I really liked that with skateboarding for photographers is like, you know, if you're a photographer that likes to capture the human form, you know, so often we're trying to find the human form in some interesting way, right? You're either trying to find someone that looks interesting because they you know, have had a hard life and that's what makes someone just, they wear their entire life on their face or their body is contorted because of their occupation or whatever it may be. The human form being in some contorted, interesting way is kind of why you, what you look for or someone's dressed interestingly or whatever. Skateboarders are going to give you every look in the world. <laughs> you know, it's like a gymnast or something. They're just going to be all over the place and I thought this series of images was kind of interesting with Anthony that you know just to balance himself you know these are all practical moves everything he's doing uh, well I don't know that for sure I would guess that some of it is style but some of it is practicality like you can't ride on a rail without putting your arms out to keep your balance so or if you do maybe it's a lot more difficult or something so anyway just something I thought was interesting with, uh, and with just the human form being so exaggerated, which makes for interesting photos. Something I didn't do here, which maybe I should have, is I didn't play with blur at all. I purposely set my shutter speed to be fast enough where I f froze enough of the motion. You can see on the image on the left here, you know, he does have some hand blur and stuff because he was moving pretty quick, but I think my, my shutter speed was pretty high on a lot of these, and I was trying to freeze time for sure. I could see trying to blur and make make it very apparent that they're in a lot of motion, but I didn't do that. Um, I really like the negative space in the middle two images. I wish I kind of moved myself down and put Anthony in that entire negative space more. Um, that's something that I would probably look at a lot more the next time I shoot skateboarders, which I intend to do this year. So Anthony, hit me up on Instagram if you are going to be up there. Um, is I want to put, you know, there's trees in the background, there's buildings. Um, I want to put them in as much negative space as possible so that the human form is just like literally framed. You know, you can see just them. I need to do that more. He was willing to pose for this. I made a, uh, I'll show you at the end of the uh, presentation that I made a print of this and um, I cropped in quite a bit on the print. I probably would do so even more. I printed these not long after I shot them in 2020 and I have gotten much better in the dark room um, so I could do a lot more uh, with these prints I think now than I would have been able to then but it's a great shot of them anyway. I think it's awesome. Lesson number two from, not specifically Anthony, but all of the skateboarders that were there, accept failure as the most probable outcome. So I think in photography, if you're just getting started and you end up with an entire blank roll of film like I have done more than once, I've cried over blank film, um, either I shot the entire thing backwards, I've done that once. I don't even know how that's even possible, but I did it. Um, or I put my 
the, the wrong chemical in first. There's only three chemicals, and somehow I put the three in before the number one. So it's so easy to mess up this process, which makes it worth it. You know, it's kind of like the fact that it's difficult makes it cool um, and infuriating. But I love this about skateboarders. They know that 99 times they're not going to land the hardest trick that they are trying to do. You know, when you watch the Olympics recently in this snowboarding and skateboarding, if you watch the if you watch the Summer Olympics this year as well, they're only going for one trick. There's only one trick that they have sitting out there that's, you know, one one rung on the ladder higher than they currently are. There is maybe a set of a dozen tricks that they can land almost every time, but there's that one that they're trying to do now that they know that 99 times they're not going to land it. And yet there's that 100th time where they do. And for me, my personal lesson from that is I'm fairly certain that if I ask people to allow me to shoot their photo because I want to do environmental portraiture, that I'm going to mess up most of them. I'm going to get there. I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to forget a uh, battery. I'm going to put the film in incorrectly. Um, I won't have enough light when I get there, and I would have assumed that I would, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And I just think that I have to accept failure as the probable outcome, but when I don't fail or when I get results that I'm happy with, that's where it makes it worth it. And then eventually, maybe, you make the 99 failures out of 100, you make that 50, you make that 25, whatever. And, and I don't know if you'll ever get to 100% hit rate, but I, I, I guarantee you don't. Because uh, even, even the best of the best that are out there, it's very easy to go online and find all of their failures. You know, the Ansel Adamses and uh, Cartier Barson and all these people that are very well known for having amazing photographs easy to find their terrible ones. Everyone but Vivian Meyer, maybe. She was probably the best of all time. I'm, I'm putting her as the goat. Uh, she might be my favorite. So here's a few, fail few failures. Um, I think sharing your failures is important um, to a degree. You know, obviously you don't, I don't think you need to harp on it or you don't need to ask for sympathy or whatever. Um, I just said that I had film that I literally blew away. I probably made, I probably made some pretty good images <laughs> that are gone forever because I put the wrong chemical in first. Um, I don't even know what was on those things. I'll never know. Um, sorry for saying um so many times, but I didn't write down like a script. So uh, here's some failures that I had. They're still fun. I think sharing them is good. These guys certainly do. They're skating right next to their peers and not landing a thousand times. But I wonder if that sharing of your failures, if if they were alone in the skate park, would they give up before they landed? Because if they don't land it and they're with other people and those people knew that they gave up, is there that little bit of peer pressure to push yourself to finally get it? that maybe you wouldn't have done if you were on your own. Certainly there are people out there that are driven enough to do it without anybody around, but maybe some of us are, would say, you know, without people knowing that I'm even trying this. So it's kind of like putting it out there, like I, me saying that I want to take portraits of people. If I never told anybody that, then if I never did it, no one ever knew that I didn't do it. Something to think about. Ethan was very nice. Um, He was kind of quiet. Uh, if I'm, if my, I'm trying to go through my memory now. He seemed to be trying one trick. I don't, you know, you can tell from the the middle image here that he probably didn't land this one, as far as I know. Maybe he did, uh, but he's up there, you know. And I think he was trying something over and over, if my memory's right. So again, trying something over and over. I don't know if this is his brother or not. There was there was a Ethan and there was a Dylan. And I don't know which one was Dylan because these guys were flying all over the place. And I was they, they were very nice and, and I got to talk to him for a few minutes. But um, he was doing this. This cat here was doing stuff that was a little bit more technical, it seemed like. 
you know, you can see him kind of. I know there's a there's a word for that in. Uh, I used to play like Tony Hawk Pro Skater, you know, so I have experience. But there was that move of like being on your two wheels on the back. It's not just a wheelie. I think there's another. There's another term for that. It's not coming to me. Um, he was trying very technical things. He was not getting out there getting big air like some of the other people were really trying to push themselves as far as their vertical and transitions between between obstacles and things. And he just seemed to be really trying some more technical things, which kind of reminds me of... Um, I'm going to butcher this guy's name, but he's a really great photographer that is also a professional skateboarder. I think it's Ray Barbary? I don't know. Do a Google search. But um, he's super, super good photographer. Uh, shoots Leicas and is sponsored by Leica and has his own Leica camera and everything. But he's uh, super talented, so he's he's it's legit. But he has that technical way of skateboarding. He'll skate. He'll skateboard just down a sidewalk and just be like kind of dancing the whole way down. It's really really cool. So I think it's neat to see that there's different styles in skateboarding. There's different styles in photography. There's no right or wrong way. I don't think at all in photography. Whether you shoot on an iPhone or with a cheese it box, I think it's cool. And so. If this guy wants to do more technical things while someone else is really trying to get 10 feet above the jump, both are very, very cool. And I think they, they recognize that as well. Lesson number three, applaud the attempts as well as the successes. One thing that all of these skateboarders did was when someone really tried to go for it, which they, some of them didn't know each other's name when I talked to them. So they didn't know each other personally, but they knew each other from seeing each other at the park and stuff. And when someone tried to do a trick that they knew that that person probably didn't try before and they failed, uh, or even remotely close got it, uh, they would all use their skateboard and hit it against the uh, against the ramps and stuff and like kind of like back in the day when you think like of the Englishmen's you know kind of hitting their cane on the floor when they agree with something that's what they did for each other um, they would do that to kind of applaud the fact that they even tried whatever it is what they were trying and so I think that's a good lesson for us as photographers too is that it's real easy to be critical of the dude that's walking down the street shooting vintage cars with Portra 400. If you ever watched a YouTube video for more than five seconds, you will know that there's about 15 people making a lot of money uploading YouTube content just doing that. Walking down a street in a big city, shooting some vintage cars on Portra 400, and putting it up on YouTube, and they make money. It's very easy to make fun of that. I've even made fun of that in my head a few times. But they're trying to do something. Maybe they'll break away from that eventually. Maybe maybe we'll look back at their photos and see that they're important in 20 years. Whatever. Um, so applauding the attempt. So I think if you ever see someone that is just off of center, you know, you see someone upload something to Instagram that you thought could be better, don't always share the criticism. It's important that they get criticism so they can improve. Like, hey, did you notice that this misses or this misses? But don't do it every single time. Applaud. This is awesome. It's so awesome that you even tried this. I think I'm going to try to do that. Um, my... This is weird. There it goes. I hope you guys can see this. My, my screenshot was, or my um, screen wasn't updating. So Bill uh, traveled from like 80 miles away. So I guess there's, this skate park is the only one for like 100 miles. And um, th there's another one that's about equal distance from his house that he, in Bloomsburg, I think, that he said isn't as, isn't as good, I guess. So 
in our little area, you know, where I live here in Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania, it's, you know, it's a nice little skate park for people. And so he comes all the way up here for that 80 miles. Think about that. It's like, you know, that's to me. And he just had twins. Those are his kids that he's pushing around there. Uh, I don't, I don't think I asked him the kids' names. It's terrible. I should have, because like, what if that, like, what if he's the next Tony Hawk or one of his kids is like, you know, who knows? And I was like, ah, I should have captured some information, but because um, this photo in 30 years could be something. Uh, he was super nice, was willing to be photographed. He was definitely celebrating people. No one knew him. When I said, did you know who Bill's name was? No one knew his name. He was celebrating people regardless. Um, I tried to find him online because he seems like a pretty cool cat. I thought maybe he was you know, somewhere online. I have not been able to find him. I don't know, Anthony or Dylan or Ethan or any of you other guys that know this or anybody else that's watching this. If if I put it up on YouTube, maybe somebody will find it under Carbondale Skate Park. But if you know him, please let me know because I'd love to follow him on Instagram or something. I couldn't find him anywhere. Some more shots of Bill. He went big. He was definitely good. There's no question. Um, he landed a fair number of his attempts on everything he was doing. I think it was pretty obvious that he was talented. And or, you know, is it talent or is it just he probably worked hard and fell a lot when he was a kid. This series was super enjoyable. Uh, I cannot wait to shoot this year. I have learned so much. I would have been on the other side. Like, look at the one on the left of Josh. I would have been on the other side. The sun was coming from that direction. I would have been on the other side. Stupid. You know, these are simple little things that if I make those just small corrections, I think it's going to go a long way. I'd love to bring a, a, a flash with me. I think I had a flash that day. I didn't even know how to even put it on my camera. i got to be honest with you. I didn't even know because film cameras only flash sync at certain uh, speeds. So I don't know. Can I shoot at one one thousandth of a second and have the flash going on? Like I didn't know some of those things. So I had a flash with me and never even used it. But this this next time, I know exactly what I'm bringing. I know exactly what I'm gonna try to do. I have a wider lens now than I ever did before because I bought one for the Canon. Um, I'm gonna put a flash on. Go there in the late evening. Give as much room to the skateboarder as possible. Have the light be at my back. Gonna be much better. Not you know not even better. Like just more impactful results. I really look forward to it. So to all, all the guys that saw me there that day um, and were willing to meet like some weird person putting a camera in their face, thank you very much. Uh, I really do appreciate it. I hope I see you guys this year there. Um, I did make prints in my dark room. They're not great. They're okay. Uh, for those of you that know how to print in a dark room? You're probably looking at them and seeing why don't I have more tonal range and contrast in these uh, prints. The negatives are actually pretty decent, so I have no excuse. I should be able to make better prints uh, when I do it again with this series. This is I, I only did this series once downstairs, so um, this is in my dark room in my basement. Um, so uh, I look forward to doing more prints of these, and I'm going to go and give them to the skateboarders so they have them uh, just as a thank you. So thank you very much for watching my review of my photo series. Uh, at the end of each photo series, I'd like to share another photographer. Um, actually, before I do, if anybody has any questions, uh, I just pulled up the chat now, so I did not see it um, before and I, I'm thankful that there was probably not that many people watching I have no idea because this is my first time so I look forward to watching it back and seeing how terrible I did but if anybody has any questions specifically about this photo series or the cameras that I used or anything at all feel free to put it in the chat because I know so many people helped me um, when I would message them and say how did you get this to work and what chemicals do you buy and I can't even tell you how many questions I've asked people. And they were very gracious with their answers, so. I'm gonna look in the chat here to see if there's any questions before I promote the second photographer because I do want to promote this photographer, but. 
It doesn't look like we have any questions, which is fine. I don't know how much lag there is. Am I a minute behind? Am I 30 seconds behind? I don't even know. Thanks, uh, Clever Soul. I don't know your first name, Clever Soul. Um, I don't know if you share it or not. It doesn't matter. But um, uh, dig your stuff too, man. Yeah, I wanted to have a, a format for this because it just kind of gives me an, a beginning and an end. Um, I think it's cool that people jump on, edit some images, have people like kind of like – it's kind of like working with other people. And I think I might do that every now and then. Maybe the next time I'm scanning my negatives or something, I might go live on Twitch and just let – you know – just have some people to commiserate with, you know. Um, but as far as being able to say, here is a bunch of stuff that I just created. I think I'm going to do one for each series. I'm saving these for me as much as I am for anybody else. When I want to look back at these photo series, I would love to have all of this encapsulated in this way. A quick, you know, I did have that intro in the beginning, but this is about a 20, 25 minute review of a day's worth of film and that's kind of cool so I, I, I'm hoping I can do that you've never done film photography um, I don't recommend getting into it <laughs> uh, that's not true I it has its place there's definitely a use for it uh, I really like it but if you love digital uh, and you're totally happy with what you got going on, do that. One thing I can tell you that you can do as a film photo a, a digital photographer that can have you experience film a little bit. Um, there's a couple things you can do. Turn off your display on the camera. Do not use it. Do not do a first shot to see where your exposure is. Do not shoot a few times to get your lighting right. Do none of that. So start off from frame one knowing what your settings should be with your digital camera. That's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is limit yourself to 24 or 36 photos or even 18, you know, depending on what you're shooting. If you're going to shoot like a real sit down portrait, give yourself 18 shots which probably sounds insane to a digital photographer. You're probably like, and I'm not saying only 18 shots because yes, I could have multiple rolls of film that I shoot, which is certainly possible. But give yourself some finite number, 36 or something. 36 frames. Say you're gonna shoot only 36 frames. That's another constraint that film brings that I really enjoy. So one, turn off the camera in the back. Two, give yourself 36 frames. If you don't have the self-control to give yourself only 36 frames, do a couple things. Turn off the ability to just hold the shutter button down and shoot a whole bunch. Turn that off. And the other thing you can do is, which sounds crazy, but either put in a smaller memory stick into the camera or put a large file on the memory stick that eats up 90% of the thing and only give yourself enough room to do like 50 images or something. Like do something crazy like that. Try that on a couple of things and you'll be shooting very much like film. The last thing I will say is let that memory chip sit for three weeks or a month before you look at it again. So go shoot, no screen, shoot, 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 36 frames, come home, take that memory stick out, shove it in a drawer, look at it in a month. That's film photography, but doing it digitally. Thirty seconds or a minute. Thank you very much, Clever Soul, for letting me know. Yeah, I think it's a really cool skill set that can be useful even in the digital realm later. So when I pick up my digital camera now, I am shooting way different than I did before. Not only less frames, whatever, but I pick up digital now for very specific context. If I'm going to go shoot wildlife photography, I pick up my digital or whatever. But I just approach photography way different because I did it. Even if I stopped film now, which I'd like to do it for at least 10 years, but even if I stopped film now, I would shoot digital different because of my experience with film. 
I do use a light meter. Um, a lot of the cameras have a light meter built into them, um, and some of them are fairly good. Uh, but in addition to the light meter that's built into the camera, I usually use my iPhone app. Um, I have not sprung for... I've been doing this in stages. I mean, I've put a decent amount of money into this hobby already, thousands and thousands of dollars um, over the last few years for the chemicals, for the dark room, for the cameras themselves, uh, paper, film, whatever. Uh, and so I'm just doing it kind of like I'm not buying everything all at once. So I haven't found myself super needing a fancy, fancy light meter. Eventually I'll probably grab one. I saw one at a thrift store the other day and I almost bought it, but some of the light meters are based off of a chemical reaction. So there's actually like a piece of photosensitive metal in them. And there might be, I don't know for sure, you might want to do some research on this, but there, the metal, because if you can imagine, if you know, you know how heat expands everything, there's metal that is so sensitive that even just a little bit of light makes it move. So by having a light meter that has that, so some of these older ones could be literally a piece of like tin or copper or whatever, I don't know what material it is, that will react to the smallest amounts of light inside of there and then that little gauge moves. And you just don't know if those are still as sensitive as they were when they were made and the worst thing I could possibly do is have a light meter that was inaccurate because then everything everything's done for then. So if I did buy a light meter I'd probably have to you know really spend some money probably 500 bucks or something like that so I haven't done it yet. I appreciate all the questions. Gives me more to kind of just chat about which I wouldn't probably think of unless I was asked. Um, but Clever Soul I'm not saying that you I'm not saying anyone needs to do film, but it is really fun to do, uh, even as just like a little side thing. But with digital, you can get there. All right. Um, I do want to promote this photographer here, since we're talking about skateboarding today. Uh, Louisa Dor, I do not know how to say, I believe she's a woman, Louisa Dor. Her photography was re recently picked up on multiple publications so if you're a photographer you've probably seen her work recently within like the last five months she did this photo series of these women that skateboarders um, I believe in South America and they are just I mean some of my favorite photos I've seen in a long time if I shot these photos I mean I probably would just sell all my gear and be done um, just just amazing 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 stuff such interesting people look at those hats like who wears those hats it's just awesome um she has a lot more photos on her website so uh from this series and others that i think were, were are great um and the colors and just doing everything in, in, at golden hour and oh it's great um thank you very much I have a website you can go check. It has other stuff that I've shot on there. Uh, I haven't done a ton, and I'm just getting started. I don't know when my next Twitch stream will be, but it'll likely be about 25 to 30 minutes covering a photo series, and I might hop on to stream uh, just some, you know, scanning or developing or something in the in the meantime, just to have some fun with everybody. But thank you very much for paying attention and for your questions and. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this has been great.